you've watched the film and liked it, I'm not sure the director and writer and producer and the one that gets himself in crippling debt over these fucking films while everyone else just has a holiday with them. Um, if you hated the film, I was there to lend support to Justin Park, who did everything. I'm Justin Park. Uh, I have been uh, with Purgatory Pictures since 2018 when we recorded Monster, uh, which was the first film that Purgatory Pictures made. My name is Jamie. I was the director of photography for the call. So I am Maria Metheringham and I am the lead actress in the call. You have yourself a good day. Fuck you. What were you hoping to achieve with the making of the call? I wanted to make a cool slasher film, I'll be honest. The call was going to be the next film because it's relatively easy to make. You know, whenever we are sitting down to write these, these screenplays and things, we do it knowing that we can get these locations, we can get these actors. So, you know, you've got what, I think two main locations in the call and you've got uh, two main actors for the whole thing. So it's relatively small and affordable for us to shoot. The call was an interesting one. It was kind of a juxtaposition of like two kind of different styles. It's a basically a kind of a mash of between phone booth and the toolbox murders. Kind of like a slasher horror film, that was that was the, the aim. Uh, one location, minimal actors, and just try and make something that's really intense. Which is what um, I liked about, you know, working with Matt and the team is that the, the production value always gets bigger. Uh, the scripts get um, a bit more intense. So it just felt like, you know, go from this level of now, and then the next step is to just amp it up a little bit more, which I think we did. Leave me alone! How do you know each other? And do you enjoy working together? Uh, the whole point of Purgatory Pictures, it was supposed to be a big family thing, you know, like the Carry On teams, the Hammer teams. Um, gradually, as we work on more films, I'm seeing who I want to work with again and again and, and, and who was good for that production, but not necessarily for another production. And so, Crew-wise, cast-wise, it was always people that we knew. Um, the only unknown for this one, I believe, was Mark Sears. Matt, I knew from, so um, Matt's a horror author. That's what he does uh, as a full-time profession. Uh, and I'd started writing some horror books and started publishing them. And that's how we met. We met at a convention, we chatted, uh, swapped books over, um, became friends from then. Um, that was kind of our link in, and then we started going off, we started doing bouldering together because we were really into climbing at the time. Um, yeah, and, and we got on really well. Then, as I said, when we worked on Monster together for the first time, we worked really well on that. Maria, we met through next door, um, and then she came on, they came, absolutely brilliant and a good laugh. So uh, we were able to work with her. And Jay, uh, Maria brought Jay on board and just kind of fitted in, just fitted in sort of straight away. You know, he, he had a good sense of humour, he knew what he was doing with his camera, you know, he was, he was uh, eager and kind of keen to, to do stuff with us, happy to work in the same sort of way. It's relaxed, but hard working at the same time. Uh, and it's fun. So I met um, Matt quite a few years ago on uh, Next Door. I think I must have been talking to Matt on social media because obviously people in the film industry, um, you kind of get to, to kind of know them online and like someone you've worked with has worked with them and then they've worked with someone you know. But we had quite a good rapport on set and then, you know, we ended up doing a few films in lockdown, uh, just like short scripts that we were able to film in our houses and then put them together and, you know, make a little kind of funny or, you know, little kind of like horrible film. And then <clears throat> me and Jay, we set up our own production company called Cine North Studios. And we were making short films in and out of lockdown when we could. And uh, because Matt was looking for a new cameraman and Jay's such a good DOP, you know, I suggested him and we all ended up working together. To start with, I met Matt through Maria um, on the project They Came From The Sky, I saw them. Um, Matt was after a cameraman and we were just coming out of lockdown and I wanted to keep my creative juices flowing as well. So. I offered up my services and we went down to to where Matt lives and we made a fucked up film 
quite wacky, which was, it was great. I mean, to get, just to meet everyone, have a laugh. And, and we came away with a quite a wacky film, which to the day we're, we're quite proud of because it's every time we watch it, we just have a laugh. So that's where I met Matt. And then obviously Justin was there as well, working with Matt. So that's how I met Justin. Um, and then the actors like Danny and Rod. And uh, yeah, it was, it was great. That's how we all met uh, uh, the Purgatory team. I think we work well together because we just, we have a good rapport. We get on, we have a laugh. And I think that's the main thing on a indie set. If you can all get on and enjoy yourself, you know, the, creatively it just helps so much um, you know you don't want to be on a set where you clash with someone over petty things because then that just causes a horrible atmosphere for everyone else but we all just get on we have a laugh we have a good banter together so I think that's that's a great thing what the fuck went wrong I fucked it up you know it's really boring <laughs> it's, it's yeah Something went wrong. The script was good. It worked you know, on paper, but as soon as we put that onto onto the screen, the pacing was all over the place, and it just it just wasn't the sort of film that I actually envisioned making. The film that people are watching today is not the film we made. The film we made was, you know, the backgrounds were boring. The 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 acting in places wasn't as strong as it was in other places. The sound was a little bit off camera work wasn't great some of the the shots that i had chosen were, were fucking dog shit um so yeah when we watched it it was just a real slow burn film with all of these issues two major things uh caused us a problem the first pretty catastrophic one was that a camera broke halfway through the shoot the the camera which we were using uh, the a cam just decided to blow up on us quite literally the motherboard just fried um, it's like a head gasket on a car, you can't really predict when it's going to happen, but it just chose to happen halfway through a shoot. So that itself just sent my head into a complete tailspin and we were just, me and Matt were just trying to work out how we can continue the shoot with, you know, without jeopardising everyone else's role as well. And we're indie filmmakers, we don't have a lot of cameras around, that is a huge issue and we're kind of lucky it's never happened before on set. <clears throat> However, we were lucky that Jay had another camera. So he had two cameras, so he was able to use um, his second one. And a lot of what we had filmed up to that point with all these flowing camera shots, like there's a beautiful one where Maria takes a jacket off and a camera goes past her and round. And it's just a swooping shot and it looks great. But then suddenly, Halfway through, we no longer have the capability to do that kind of shot. So now I'm dutching the angles and the camera's on the tripod or we're doing the shaky cam kind of thing. So it kind of changed the way the film looks stylistically halfway through. Thankfully to people um, that weren't there when we were making it, they won't notice that. We, we, we overcome that, but with that as well, um, a few more issues arose where like the camera settings on the reserve camera weren't set to the cam uh, A camera settings, which then, you know, followed on with some issues during the edit then when we tried to sync up sound. You know, we only realized there were sound issues afterwards in the edit because the camera had been set at this speed, sound at this speed, the two don't tally up, so you've got to redo it all um, in the edit, which apparently, because I didn't do that, apparently it was really hard. Uh, I think Jay did it, and then Sound Guy Veden had to redo it again. Um, so that delayed the, the, you know, the edit of everything. So after the film was shot, it was passed over to Jay to edit. So he edited Box, um, and we would do the same with the call. So we passed it over to Jay. Jay had it for some time, and I'm not 100% sure why he had it for that length of time. Um, we have shot the film in, I want to say, May. Um, April or May, and so the idea was, oh, we try and get it out for sort of Halloween time. Originally, I was the uh, the editor on the call because me and Matt edited Box, and they came uh, together as well. So we thought we'd it'd just be a natural thing just to carry on and do it the same way we did. Um, 
but because of the issue we had with the camera and um, personal issues going on at the time, um, it just kind of took the, the priority was not the call for me at the time. We still didn't have the cut. There was a kind of a, an assembly cut, but um, yeah, it wasn't the finished article. So me and Matt sort of said to Jay, okay, give it back to us and we'll edit it together. So me and, so he did, he gave us the files and then we were able to get all the, the necessary uh, software to do the edits. And this is a really important thing that we learned that actually us being able to edit together um, and editing our own work means that we can make those decisions on the fly and it can occur for happy accidents. A focus issue with the Sony camera where it kept trying to do this irritating autofocus thing. So when Maria comes in uh, to the house for the first time and she turns the light on and she goes up the stairs, the camera changes the focus and then changes it back again. So that's why when you watch the film, I made it glow red and then pull back to normal color to tie in with the focus issue. And I added like the type noise as well to make it look like it's a stylistic thing. But really I'm just covering a massive fuck up because we only had that one angle. We didn't shoot enough shots. We didn't start taking close-ups. We didn't take stuff to quick cut. So not only do you have Maria against this white background, you've then also got the camera holding and we're not really being able to cut to other places and to, to, to other points of view in order to make it visually interesting. So your eyes kind of get a little bit bored and a little bit drifting away from it. Um, yeah, which was a problem. Something that we didn't notice until until uh, afterwards. Could we have done something about it? Absolutely. We could have taken a lot more shots a lot more quick cuts that we could have then sort of cut between. And it would have just made the film look quicker as well. The pace would have felt a bit more dynamic. When we do films, normally we do multiple takes, different angles, and then in the edit, you can fix things. Like when we did Box, uh, it was the first film I'd acted in, and some of the acting was atrocious. But because we had multiple angles, I could pick and choose the bits I used. On this one, I really kind of just fucked Maria over. So she's suddenly doing this acting. We're there in, you know, caught up in a moment thinking, yeah, yeah, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And then when you look back at it, there's some scenes that just aren't as strong as they could be. And you're just like, shit. But now we don't have the ability to edit around it with different shots. Because the shots took too long, there was a pacing issue. Uh, we needed things to be more visually dynamic. It's a film. Yeah, we're, we're, we've got sound and we've got visuals. And it's mainly the visuals that are stimulating the eye. So we need, okay, we need to change this around. Um, so that's when we did reshoots. Um, or no, not reshoots, sorry. That's when we did pickup shots. So I got uh, like Maria, Jay, Justin, come down, put black background up in the living room. And then we had close-ups of them screaming or covered in blood that we can do as subliminal flashes throughout the film or slightly longer flashes. Putting that in gives a little more showing the internal thoughts of the character. Like when uh, Maria is on the phone, it's a long shot with a voice on the other end just talking about her husband. Fucking boring. But the moment we then add flashes of the husband covered in blood, or you had the flashes of the husband and her together, you know, like playing around with an ice cream or flowers, you get more emotional context for that particular story, you know, story arc. I think that worked really, really well to break the stuff up. We also didn't have any shots of the caller on the phone. So uh, again, it mats, I had a hoodie and I thought, well, fine, well, I'll put that hoodie on, we shoot it in black and white, and you can't tell that it's me or Mark. Um, and then we just took some shots of me on a phone with my hood up. In hindsight, probably should have taken even more shots of that because uh, we had to mess around with them from there. But at least we could break that up uh, at that point. And then the other thing was the ending. Yeah, it was a big gore ending, but it didn't really have any oomph into it. So this is when, um, quite brilliantly, I have to say, Matt came out with this idea of like, you know, you've got the big dildo with the nails in and he pushes it up in there. And so Matt went, right, well, I'll get some tubing, cut that in half, pack it with mincemeat, we'll put that in there and we'll just film it from there. And yeah, it doesn't look real. We all know it doesn't, we're not going for realism here. We're just looking for, a, ooh, that's a bit horrible, isn't it? I mean, the whole point of this documentary was 
was thinking, you know, let's release the documentary, include the film as part of that, so people can see us put our hands up and go, you know what, we fucked up, this is how we fucked up, this is how we tried to fix it, learn from us, you know, don't make these mistakes. Hey baby, you all checked in yet? Do you have any advice for other filmmakers? Really, it's all down to the script. Um, if you are wanting to get into this industry and making a film, uh, you, know, you and I have spoken about it before, write a script based around what you own. So, you know, if you give us a script and it's set in space, all right, dickhead, how are you going to go and film that then? And you may have some really cool ways to film it. You may have thought about that. That means that's absolutely fine. But I've had scripts handed to me, you know, I'm looking for help getting the money for this. Page one is set in a prison, there's a riot going on. It's like, well, how are you going to afford that as a first time filmmaker? And yes, there are grants. Yes, there are business people willing to put money in, but it's hard. If you want to make films, you would bring the script right down, minimal characters, minimal locations, film what you've got, you know, film people in a, in a shop behind a counter talking for a whole film like Kevin Smith. Learn from Tarantino, who learned from Dov Simmons. You know, take your actors to a warehouse, butcher them with a good story. It's cheap, it's entertaining to watch. You know, keep it simple. Equipment side of stuff, you know, is it something that you want to learn to be able to do or do you hire someone in? It might be more cost effective to hire someone in than it is to buy equipment or hire equipment and learn how to use it. It's entirely up to you on how long you want that journey to be. Um, and the other thing I think is planning. Plan, plan, plan. I mean, um, a film is a project. It's a basic project management. You know, you need to understand what your shot's going to be, how long they're going to take. You need to understand your scheduling right from the start. How long is it going to take to finish a script? When are you going to shoot? When are you going to get the casting? When are you going to get the props sorted? All of that stuff needs to be planned out. Uh, to the nth degree. It will go wrong when you start filming. It does, you, and you will have to learn to problem solve, you'll have to learn to bend and flex to that plan. But that baseline plan that you have to start with is so important to have that understanding and then, and then move from there. And the other thing when it comes to budget, don't underestimate the cost of feeding people. That's where so much of your money is gonna go. How stressful is it to make a film? Um, unfortunately, the stress has started to come into it now because it is now just finances. So, you know, a lot of the time I am putting my hand in my pocket to get the stuff paid for if I can't raise it all through crowdfunding. So the biggest thing um, is just keeping it all together. Um, and it helps because I don't do it by myself. You know, I do have Justin. And Justin is very uh, meticulous with his spreadsheets. Um, and he's good at planning. So where I drop the ball, he's there ready to pick it up and go, actually, Matt, you need to do blah, 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 blah. And away I go and do it. Um, but it is, it is hard work. The idea is that you try not to think of it as work. And in the early days, it never was. It was just, I want to make films. I've always wanted to make films. It's a hobby for me. If you start your own career thinking in that way as well, you're gonna have more fun and more success doing it as opposed to thinking, this is now a business and I need to make money from it. So if I, I just basically think, right, I'm gonna lose money, but I'm gonna have a cool week making a film and getting nice and bloody. Um, and there are parts that I really fucking hate. Like I hate casting because, you know, well, we're filming this on the set of GPK, hence all the, the stuff. The actress, from episode one, dropped out halfway through. I say dropped out halfway through, she just fucking vanished with no word. We've never been able to get hold of her since. So we just wasted all that money filming with her. The actress for this episode just disappeared. So she's all up for it, all up for it. I email her the last bits, nothing. So luckily, because we keep learning from this and we've got backup plans, we were able to keep filming. Um, but yeah, you, you're going to go mad and casting is a ball ache. Um, you just do it in baby steps. Just baby steps, take each one. Yeah. 
Can you describe the call in three words? Absolute. Dog. Shh. Ah, the call in three words. Oh, grizzly, as in like, you know, there's a lot of sobbing. Probably many lessons learned. Uh, perverted. Not that bad. Or holy fucking shit. <laughs> Grizzly perverted goats. There you go. That'll do. Stylistic art house thriller. Yeah. It's not a bad movie. There's some really, really nice shots in it. There's some really, really nice moments in it. Um, and I think that our initial knee jerk reaction at it um, was just an artist not being happy with the product and seeing the flaws that they created as it becomes its own thing. Um, I think it's a fun little solid nasty indie horror movie.